Glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Today, brothers and sisters, we are looking at the importance of marriage in the eyes of the Lord from the perspective of a man taking another man's wife. So the Lord has always established this principle that marriage is sacred, and the Lord, he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, we read, Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, the same yesterday and today and forever. And so the Lord's mind is not one that fluctuates. Contrarily to our minds, us human beings, who come up with philosophies as time goes by, the Lord remains steadfast in the way that he sees things, in the way that he has his counsel freely without having to give an account to anyone. And therefore, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, in the beginning, that had already been established that it is a pillar of the relationship between the man and the woman that they should be husband and wife. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. It doesn't say that they shall be a flesh and a half. It doesn't say that they shall be a threesome flesh. It says that they shall be one flesh. And so we see that there's a perfect alignment between that which the Lord had spoken in the beginning and that which he spoke himself when he came to dwell among us in a human vessel. We therefore go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19, starting at verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And so a man cannot come and take part of that one flesh and leave with it, because that one flesh is now one body. It is a great mystery. And so we see that from the beginning in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord said that it was a man and a woman, and they shall be one flesh, and it is reiterated in Matthew chapter 19. Now, this is also what Paul the Apostle reminded us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So, brothers and sisters, we have clearly established that the Lord doesn't change. And we have seen in Scripture that it is indeed the case, because in Genesis the Lord told us that a man shall go unto his woman to be husband and wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the same thing is reiterated to us in the Gospel of Matthew, and Paul also makes mention of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So having said all this, having seen the importance of marriage in the eyes of the Lord, and the importance of the bond between a man, a husband, and a woman, a wife, we are going to look now at specifically the story of Abraham and Abimelech and see the power that resides in this bond of marriage. And this, by looking at the consequences of violating that sacred union. So we now turn to Genesis chapter 20. This takes place after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, 
she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now, by the way, if you look at the name Abimelech in terms of its meaning in the Hebrew, it means my father is king. And so my father is king. Abimelech has a relationship with God as though God were his father. That's the image that we have here, which is relevant because in verse 3, we will see how Abimelech conversed with God and God spoke to Abimelech. Verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him. And so you see that relationship here. God will speak to us. God watches out for us. Abimelech had conversations with his creator. We temporarily turn to Job chapter 33, starting at verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. And so God speaks to us. God warns us. And one of the ways he does that is in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon man, in slumberings upon the bed. One word that I found interesting here is in verse 17, that he may withdraw man from his purpose. And when you look at that word in the Hebrew, to withdraw, it means to turn aside. It means to cause to turn aside. And in this story, as we will find out shortly, God turned Abimelech aside from his intentions that he had concerning Sarah. We will get back to this in a moment. So just remember that God speaks to us on the one hand, and on the other, he also instructs us. He seals our instruction and may withdraw us from purposes that we have set in our hearts. And this is magnificent. So that was Job chapter 33. We now go back to Genesis chapter 20 to continue with our story. Genesis chapter 20, back at verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, she is a man's wife. See, in verse 2, when it said, he took Sarah, here we see in verse 3, the woman which thou hast taken. And if you look in the Hebrew, that word take means to lay hold of, to seize, to acquire, to take to wife. Do you see? He laid hold on Sarah. Abimelech took Sarah. She's a woman which he has taken. And the Lord will declare, thou art but a dead man. He is already a dead man. There is already a sentence that is laying upon his life. There is already a sentence that is pending actively upon his life. And the reason for that is the following. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And so the consequence of Abimelech having taken Sarah unto him, because she is a man's wife, because he has taken her unto him, has taken her to wife, there is a spiritual consequence that has already been pronounced in the spirit, thou art but a dead man. Now, Abimelech had not knowledge of that fact. Abimelech had not knowledge that in the spirit, there was a spiritual judgment rendered and actively pending upon his life because he could not see it with his eyes. But the judgment was there and it was pending. My friends, in this world, there are people who are dead while walking. And even the Bible teaches us this. 
For instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, we read, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. This is talking about widows who are living in pleasure and not rather abiding by themselves. And so, getting back to Genesis chapter 20, back at verse 3, God tells Abimelech in a dream by night, he speaks to him. He reveals to him things that are not known to him. Abimelech did not know. There is a sentence pending upon your life, Abimelech. Thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. The importance of marriage. It is something that you cannot violate. If you do, then you are but a dead man. Though you still have physical life or may still have it, there is a spiritual sentence of death pending actively upon your life. We go to verse 4. But Abimelech had not come near her. In other words, he had yet to touch her, which would have made things even more serious. But Abimelech had not come near her. And so the mere fact that he had taken her to wife, taken her unto him, laid hold of her, was sufficient to bring about this condemnation in the spirit. And this condemnation had operated in accordance with actions that he had taken Abimelech regardless of his own understanding of what he had done. This is to show you that the Lord is a Lord of justice. And so whether you may not be aware of certain situations in your life, not fully aware of them, there are still spiritual consequences to what you are doing, irrespective. Let us just go to Leviticus to confirm this. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 17. And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. We have the proof in the pudding here. Abimelech did not know he was taking on another man's wife, but he was in fact doing that, and he was ignorant of that fact. But that did not change the fact that it was a sin, that it was something that God is against. And therefore, there was an iniquity that he was bearing. A sentence of spiritual death was pending upon his life. Back at Genesis chapter 20, verse 4. But we do understand, however, that Abimelech, it is not that he didn't know that he should not take on another man's wife. He knew that, and he precisely tried to not do that. But the problem is that he didn't have all the information he needed in order to know that he was not committing a sin. And so the ignorance here for Abimelech is not so much that he didn't know that he should not take on Abraham's wife, but it was the fact that he did not clearly understand and know that she in fact was another man's wife. But that still does not negate the fact that he took another man's wife and therefore his ignorance, though it pertained not to the sin itself, but rather pertained to the ignorance of certain critical facts that make up the sin, he still suffers a reproach. Thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Verse 4, but Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? And so Abimelech went out of his way to listen to the testimony of Abraham and Sarah concerning the fact that they were sister and brother. And so he tried not to commit evil. And just like Abraham asked the Lord concerning the destruction in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham asked the Lord, if then be but ten righteous, will you destroy the city? And the Lord said, I will not for their sake. And so here, Abimelech, along the same line of thinking, is saying, I tried my best to avoid sinning against you, Lord. Shall you slay me for this and my nation as I am a king? Verse 5. 
said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands, have I done this? Now, this is very interesting. Being under trial, Abimelech raises a defense. Abimelech presents evidence to support his claim that he was not acting with an evil intent. Though he committed the act, he is saying, I never had the intention of committing it with an evil mind. But we saw in Leviticus that even if you have ignorance concerning a certain thing, if you still do it, it is still something for which you will suffer reproach. Now we clarified that he knew the rule and had tried to follow it. However, because he did not have a clear understanding of facts surrounding the act that he was committing, he still suffered reproach. So Abimelech is saying, I did not have evil intent, Lord. Will you spare me? Will you still slay me for this? Will I still suffer reproach for this, given that my hands are innocent? And so Abimelech raises a defense, and he brings up to the surface declarations made by others. This is very interesting, because in the situation of being judged by the Lord, we learn in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, how things will be conducted at the judgment, the great white throne, more specifically. And the verse that I want to highlight is verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And so you see that those books, aside from the book of life, there is a record of things that you have said and done and even thought in your mind. So that on the day that you stand for trial, there will be a possibility for things that you say for your defense to be confirmed or to be infirmed, to either stand or fall because your testimony will be confirmed by that which is mentioned in the books, or the books will establish something different from what you're saying. Back to Genesis chapter 20, verse five. Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God is all knowing. He knew Abimelech was telling the truth. But for the purpose of the records, if verification were to be made of his claim, in the books in heaven, it was written what went through Abimelech's mind, what he thought, what was the intention, what was the intent of his heart when he took unto him Sarah? What had he heard? What had been told him by different people? All of that is kept in the records in the books in heaven. And so this is just a reminder for us so that we keep in mind that everything we do is written in the books concerning ourselves. Verse six, and God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. Who can judge the counsels of the hearts of man but God? The secrets of our hearts, he knows. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Here Abimelech finds out that it is actually God who intervened to stop him from going any further and save him from himself in that he could have laid hands on another woman's wife. It is already a serious offense enough that he took her unto him, but the Lord suffered him not to touch her. Remember Abimelech means my father is king. 
He has a relationship with the Lord. And what is the consequence of this? The Lord is just and fair to try to preserve you where you did not have an evil intent. We go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 26. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. And so here, in this instance, Abimelech was kept by God from actually laying a hand on Sarah. And the image that we have is that the Lord, my father is king, looked out for Abimelech to prevent him from going into an area of greater danger. Now we go to Psalm chapter 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And so Abimelech committed a misstep. He did take on Sarah unto him, but the Lord saw that there was no evil intent in his heart, and the Lord upheld him with his hand to prevent him from going into, as I've said, a greater area of danger that would have been laying hands on another man's wife. We are back at Genesis chapter 20, verse 6. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife. You see here, brothers and sisters, there is a clear directive given, with the tense being imperative. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife. We are talking about Abimelech, Abimelech who unknowingly took unto him another man's wife, unknowingly, which did not preclude the fact that he still went against the law of God concerning marriage. But God himself gives a testimony that he knew that Abimelech had not done it in a cunning manner with guile. But yet the consequence remains the same. Restore the man, his wife. In other words, that which you have possession of, if it is not legitimately yours, you have to give it back. There is restitution ordered, commanded unto Abimelech concerning another man's wife. It says restore the man his wife. It doesn't say restore the man your wife. It says restore the man his wife. In other words, everything that happened never made Sarah Abimelech's wife. She remained the wife of Abraham throughout this ordeal. And this irrespective of the belief of Abimelech, because the laws of God are unmovable. He had stated it in the beginning, in the old covenant and in the new covenant, they became one flesh, Abraham and Sarah. And so no one could take away any piece of that flesh no one could separate what God had joined. Restore the man, his wife. Reparation, restitution. Even though Abimelech recognizes in his heart that he did wrong and did not have the knowledge that he needed to have in terms of the facts to prevent the problem, his repentance is still required to be accompanied by restitution. Now, therefore, Restore the man, his wife. We go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 8. This is the story of Zacchaeus. When he met the Lord, look at what he said. Luke, chapter 19, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And 
if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. In other words, Zacchaeus is saying that if he has obtained money that should not be his by wrongfully defrauding someone of that sum of money, he restores it. Not only he restores it, he restores it fourfold. You see? Now, when we apply this to the case of Abimelech, he is also called upon by God himself to restore that which he has possession of, and that is Sarah, another man's wife, and restore her to her husband. So you see the idea of restoration? Zacchaeus repented, but on top of repentance, there needs to be actions taken to restore the original situation. And in the case of money, you're going to think of interest. In the case of a person, we're going to find out shortly what happens. We are back at Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And so you see here that at the time that Abimelech is told to restore the man his wife, there is still pending a spiritual judgment of death upon his life. It is still pending. It has yet to be lifted, though Abimelech has recognized that he is in the wrong. The Lord still says, and thou shalt live, but after that there is a prayer made for him, Abimelech. Let's continue. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. In other words, the spiritual condemnation that we have spoken about that is pending upon his life, it is still there. It is still in operation. It is still active. And in order for it to be taken away, that condemnation, there needs to be repentance, but there needs to be action taken for the purposes of restitution. Let's continue. Verse 8. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning. So when he was confronted with the situation, Abimelech did not react like Cain did in the beginning. Where is your brother Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? Abimelech acknowledges the problem, and he rises up early in the morning, and he will confess everything. He will expose the situation. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. Bring the problems to the light. The Lord will help you be delivered of that situation. Bring it to the light. Don't keep it hidden. And the man were sore afraid. So the people, they had fear of the Lord. They understood that there was something done contrary to the laws of God, and they were so afraid. And so there are people who still have this fear of the Lord. Now, we also notice that Abimelech, in trying to solve the situation, in trying to solve the problem, he's trying to get back in good standing with the Lord. Remember how in Luke 16, the unfaithful steward, when he is asked to give an account of his stewardship, he has been caught in mismanaging the assets of his master. And he is quick, hasty, to try to remedy the situation. And the lesson from that story, one of the lessons, is that you should be quick to try to make amends for your mistakes. The pagans, they do it, even concerning money, regarding worldly things. But us saints, concerning heavenly things, are we as quick to try and turn things around to get back in good standing with the Lord? Abimelech is doing that. Verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Notice here he doesn't say a sin. 
he says, are a great sin, which touches on the importance of marriage, which touches on the serious consequences of fornication. Remember in the new covenant, it is said that when you sin by way of fornication, you sin against your own body. We finish verse nine, thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And the language here is quite strong. Things that ought not to be done. I'm gonna make parallels here so that you realize the importance of what happened here that makes it a great sin. Things that ought not to be done. We go to Judges chapter 20. You already know the story of the Levite and his concubine. Look at what the Levite said in Judges chapter 20, verse four. And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the man of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me. And my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel. For they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. They have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. They have done things that ought not to be done. This is the case of the Levite and his concubine. First parallel. We go now to a second parallel. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Remember when Amnon feigned illness because he was interested in his sister Tamar. He wanted to lie with her. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 11. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. And so this man wanted to lie with his sister. It ought not to be done. Do not thou this folly. Second parallel. So we see things that ought not to be done. What was done to the Levite's concubine. What was done by Amnon to his sister Tamar. To try to lie with one's sister. And so we are back at Genesis chapter 20, verse 9. The last part of that verse read, Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And this is Abimelech speaking to Abraham, who did not clearly tell him about the nature of the relationship that existed between Abraham and Sarah. Verse 10, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, and so he tells him a second time, what sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? Do you see how seriously Abimelech is fearing the Lord and the mind of the Lord in that he understands the sacred bond of marriage? Verse 11, and Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And so Abraham realizes that it is all the contrary. Abimelech has fear of God. Abimelech, my father, is king. Verse 12, and yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Verse 13, and it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness, which thou shalt shew unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. And so there was fear. Verse 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham 
and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And so we see here three pathways of restoration here. On the one hand, since he cannot give interest, he provides cattle. He provides manservants and women servants. So he provides cattle and people to serve, as was the case for Zacchaeus, who was going to restore fourfold. Well, here he can only restore Sarah, but he presents gifts alongside her to make up for the damage that he's caused. That's a first pathway. And the second pathway is that he offers residency upon the land. The land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And these two pathways, first the cattle and the servants, and the second pathway, that is residency on the land, these two pathways are accessory to the main action that was required by God himself, which is to restore Sarah, his wife, to Abraham. And so Abimelech restored him Sarah, his wife. That is the principal thing. And there are two accessory pathways, two accessory remedies that are put in place to pay as damages, that is cattle and servants on the one hand, and a right to residency. And this is magnificent. We continue in verse 16. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes. Unto all that are with thee, and with all other, thus she was reproved. And so there was money as a third pathway, as a third remedy, there was money given to Abraham, a thousand pieces of silver. Verse 17, so Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. Now listen carefully. It is only now that Abraham himself prayed unto God and the healing of Abimelech occurred. You may have thought that Abimelech was healed from the moment that he repented. You may have thought that after the restitution was orchestrated, along with the damages, that it would be all good. But we learn here that the pending sentence of spiritual death was still upon the life of Abimelech, and it's only upon prayer by Abraham that it will be lifted. All things of reparation having been orchestrated properly according to the word of the Lord. And so this again provides us with insight about the fact that when you're asking for prayer, first make things right. Proceed to restitution, proceed to the restoration of things, and then ask for the prayer for the lifting of the pending condemnation that was upon your life in the spirit, though you may not have seen it, or been aware of it with your physical eyes. Because again, Abimelech was dead while living. And we had made a comparison with a widow dead while she liveth, if she liveth in pleasure. And consequently, we understand that if she is living and yet is dead, it means that there is a spiritual aspect to the death that is being spoken of. Now, we also realize in verse 17 that it is written, God healed Abimelech, comma, and his wife, and his maidservants, and they bare children. Verse 18, for the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And so we realize that it was such a great sin, as was mentioned earlier, that is in verse 9, a great sin. We realize that the consequences were very, very serious. There was a spiritual sentence of death pending upon the life of Abimelech, but the consequences had extended unto his house. And not only his wife, but his maidservants. And so again, verse 17 Genesis chapter 20. So Abraham prayed unto God, and only at that moment, brothers and sisters, after restoration occurred and payment was made, 
in different ways. Different remedies were offered and the principal thing was done. The wife, Sarah, was returned to her husband, Abraham, and God healed Abimelech. The spiritual condemnation was written off. It was wiped clean and his wife and his maidservants and they bear children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And this is on top of the spiritual death sentence that had come upon the life that was pending upon the life of Abimelech. And so now we want to point to the extent of the consequences that were prescribed and put in effect for cause of one thing, Abimelech having taken another man's wife. Now to show you the gravity of the extent of these consequences, again, we're gonna look at two parallels. In the book of Numbers, you remember the rebellion of Korah against Moses? Numbers chapter 16, verse three. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. So by rising up like this, Korah and others were standing up to the Lord himself. Verse four, and when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face and he spake unto Korah and unto all his company saying, even tomorrow the Lord will shew who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. We now go to Numbers, still in chapter 16, we go to verse 30. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Verse 31, and it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the man that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. The point I'm making, brothers and sisters, is that Korah rebelled against the Lord. Korah offended the Lord, and the consequence was that he was destroyed alongside all the man that appertained unto him, and their houses and all their goods. So this is a first parallel concerning the fact that the household of Abimelech had been affected by the great sin that had been committed. And a second parallel we could make is simply to remember how in Job chapter one, Satan pointed out that Job was under the protection of the Lord and that there was an hedge about him, Job that is, and not only him, but all his family members and also everything that he possessed. And so you see on the flip side, when God protects you, he protects your family and your assets. Whereas here in the context of Genesis chapter 20, when he laid up a spiritual sentence upon Abimelech, it also affected his family and his belongings or at least here, we're specifically told his family because we're talking about the maids, the maid servants, and the fact that they were barren. Although at that time, you could look at servants as possessions. And so ultimately his possessions also would have been affected. And so brothers and sisters, we get back to the top to make sure we understand everything that we have pointed out. We started out by mentioning that God hasn't changed. And he's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there was always great importance given to marriage, the bond between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. And that was told us in the old covenant and the new covenant as well. 
And we realized that by looking at the story of Abimelech and Abraham and Sarah, that the Lord considered it a great sin for a man, Abimelech, to take another man's wife. Now we further realized that when there is a problem, God speaks to us. And so God went and spoke to Abimelech about the situation. And so Abimelech, my father is king, had a relationship with the Lord in that he spoke to the Lord. The Lord spoke to him. But we noticed something very interesting. Though there was a great sin that was committed, Abimelech was ignorant not about the law of the Lord concerning not taking another man's wife, but rather he was ignorant about certain facts that made his otherwise innocent action still reproachable. So this type of ignorance is different, but it remains ignorance that was reproached by the Lord. And the Lord in his goodness upheld him. Though Abimelech fell, the Lord kept him from doing something that was an even greater sin in that he kept him from touching and laying a hand on Sarah. But despite the fact that Abimelech had done this in innocence, there was still a spiritual sentence that was declared and pronounced in the spirit and that was orchestrated and was pending upon the life of Abimelech unawares to him. And God declared that to him. Abimelech could not see it with his physical eyes, but death was looming and had a hold of him already. And it is spiritually that this occurred because the law of God that does not change had been violated. And though he could not see it with his eyes, with his physical eyes, Abimelech was dead while living, just like a widow who is living in pleasure, dead while living. And so what was going to be the remedy? Well, Abimelech, having heard the reproach, acknowledged his error, and he presented a defense before the Lord, which was confirmed in the records, which was confirmed by the Lord, who is all-knowing, and he knew the heart of Abimelech. But now, interestingly enough, the innocence with which Abimelech acted did not nullify the fact that he did commit the act that was reproachful and sinful. And so the consequence had operated already. However, the Lord, seeing that Abimelech had not acted with an evil intent, not only kept him from going ahead and sinning in an even greater manner, but offered him also a way to operate restitution, reparation, and restoration. And it is not before he proceeded to confess everything and offer restoration, reparation, and restitution, and return the other man's wife has commanded it is only after he did all of this that he was able to receive prayer and be healed and have written off the spiritual declaration that had already been pronounced concerning him and that was pending upon his life. And this spiritual sentence of death was to a great extent in that it affected even his family and his belongings, if we consider the servants as possessions. But Abimelech recognized the problem, did not deny it, and came to the Lord with a mind to set things back in order. Brothers and sisters, the Lord said, now therefore restore the man his wife. Now restore the man his wife. And so it was not sufficient to provide damages it was not sufficient to offer cattle and servants. It was not sufficient to say, I give you a right of residency upon the land. It was not sufficient to give a thousand pieces of silver. It was required, the principle, now therefore restore the man, his wife, because Sarah had never ceased to be Abraham's wife. Despite the good intentions in the heart of Abimelech not to interfere with their marriage, of which he did not have a proper knowledge. And so we saw that even Abimelech was explaining to Abraham how this was something serious that ought not to be done. 
And we compared that with the folly that had occurred in Israel when a brother, Amnon, even wanted to lie down with his sister, Tamar. When certain men decided to force themselves upon a woman, the Levite's concubine, to the point of her death, and it was labeled as folly, there are things that ought not to be done. And taking another man's wife is one of those. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife. For he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. If you restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So, brothers and sisters, now we have looked at taking another man's wife and the spiritual consequences of it and how it is something that ought not to be done because marriage in the eyes of the Lord is very much important. And he changes not. Only we do with our philosophies. That's why the Bible warns us in Colossians chapter 2. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So now, brothers and sisters, you can pray to the Lord and receive understanding, or the Lord will himself speak to you concerning certain things. Either way, I hope that you find answers and teachings in this Bible study. We have discussed and talked about another man's wife, the case of Abimelech, Abraham, and Sarah. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Amen.